The Lux Radio Theater brings you Betty Davis and Paul Henry in Mr. Skeffington. Ladies and gentlemen, your guest producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Some years ago, I went to a graduation play at a dramatic school in New York City. The leading lady was a small but able miss named Betty Davis. A few days later, when we were casting for a new play, I suggested that Miss Davis be given what proved to be her first professional reading. The rest is history, for little Betty has since become the first lady of the film. One of her more recent successes is tonight's play, Warner Brothers' moving and distinguished drama, Mr. Skeffington. And co-starred in the title role tonight is Paul Henry, who has contributed so many star interpretations to the screen. The action of our play occurs between two world wars, a period during which women, like the lovely Mrs. Skeffington, discovered new freedom and leisure, largely through the medium of labor-saving methods and conveniences. One of the conveniences that rose to popularity throughout these years was Lux Flakes. And that popularity has steadily increased and spread to almost every country of the globe. In Paris, where I was a few months ago, a package of Lux Flakes was almost literally worth its weight in gold, proving that daintiness and grooming are a prime concern of women everywhere. And that, I feel, is as it should be. Now, on to our play, as the curtain rises on Act One of Mr. Skeffington, starring Betty Davis as Fanny and Paul Henry as Skeffington, with Marjorie Reardon as their daughter and Joseph Kearns as George. I called this afternoon on my cousin, Mrs. Job Skeffington. It was late when I left, almost dark. In the little park across from the house, I saw him. I don't know how I came to recognize Job, so broken he was and shabby. His hands rested on his cane, and he stared through the quiet dust like a man in a dream. Who? Who is it? Job. Job, it's I, George Trellis. And his cousin. George. For heaven's sake, Job. When did you get back in New York? I? Yesterday. I escaped, George. At the age of 62, I escaped from a Nazi prison camp. Job. Well, we... We didn't know what had happened. Are you going to see Fanny? Come on, I, I just left her. No, I... I had not planned to see her. The house... It's still there. Oh, just as it's always been, Job. Nothing's changed. Fanny's well? Oh, yes, yes, she's well. And my little girl. Little Fanny. She's fine, Job. Oh, what a pity. She left New York this noon. Gone? On her way to Seattle to be married. Married? A fine boy. Oh, they're very much in love. Married. Job, Job, come. We'll see Fanny. Uh, no, uh, later, perhaps. I don't know. Well, then come home with me. There's so much to talk about. You said that nothing has changed. Uh, no, I'd, I'd just like to sit here alone. Yes, of course, Joe. Please, uh, say nothing to Fanny about me. Not, not yet. If you wish, Joe. Good night. I went directly home. And all night long, I've sat here unable to get the picture of Job Skeffington out of my mind. <laughs> Seems incredible that nearly 25 years have passed since Job first met Fanny. Oh, how well I remember that night. Who is it? Edward? Don't you dare come in my room. Since when am I Edward? Then who is it? George. Which George? How many Georges are there in your life? Oh, three of <laughs> Georgie. Fanny. Oh, what a wonderful surprise. <laughs> well, don't I get a kiss? There. Hmm. Let me see. Yes, even after two years, you look rather nice. Rather nice? 
That's all you ever said. I'm sorry, but I just can't think of you as beautiful, even if you are. Oh, hello, Mamby. Mr. George, how do you do? Uh, tell me, I saw four strange faces downstairs. Who are they, suitors? An entirely new bat. She still has every man in New York at her feet, Mr. George. And you're going out with the bat? Out? Oh, no, it's a dinner party, and you may stay. Oh, thank you, cousin. Well, I thought I heard that voice. Trippy! Well, well, welcome back. How have you been? Why, fine, how have you been? Couldn't be better. Don't fall down in the faint, Georgie, but my brother has a job. He's working. No, I'm a customer's man. Skeffington and Company. Skeffington and Company? The Jewish firm? Yes. You like working for him? He's all right. Well, he must pay awfully well. Here you are giving dinner parties, and I thought you were practically broke. Well, the fact is, George, I made a little killing. And I thought if I gave a dinner party, it might further arouse his killer's instinct. Hmm. George, you don't have to worry about us anymore. I hope it's all true. I... Why do you say that? Because you still don't look anyone straight in the eye, Trippy. Still picking on me, Georgie. Now, now, Trippy, darling, you run along and finish dressing. You know you're always late. What is it, so? I'm very sorry, miss. A gentleman to see Mr. Trellis. Or Mr. Skeffington. Skeffington? You didn't invite him to dinner. I most certainly did not. But tell him I'll see him in the morning. Yes, sir. And, miss, your guests are beginning to arrive. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, ask Mr. Skeffington to wait. Yes, sir. Why? Well, I think it'd be a nice gesture if you saw your employer. Uh, you'll get more work out of him in the long run. He's got no right barging in here. Darling, obviously he didn't come for a free dinner. It must be something important. Well, get rid of him. I won't see him. Well. Huh? What do we tell him about Trippy? Oh, I'll think of some lie or other. Trippy keeps me in practice. Let's get it over with, Georgie. And please, don't look so worried. I'm so sorry about Trippy, Mr. Skeffington. Unfortunately, he's in bed with a severe a headache. cold. Both. <laughs> well, it's quite possible the cold brought on the headache. Uh, yes, he, he'll be at his desk in the morning, Mr. Skeffington. I hardly think so. Uh, your cousin is no longer in my employ. No longer. But if he's no longer in your employ, why hasn't he told me? Well, a man with a cold is seldom very communicative. Well, if you'll excuse me uh, now. There's uh, nothing you care to discuss with us? Well, since your cousin avoided me tonight, as undoubtedly he will again in the morning, perhaps I'd better. Uh, it's a rather delicate matter, Miss Trellis. I'm staying right here, Mr. Skeffington. I'm on my way to see the district attorney. I don't think I'm going to be able to take the standing up. Maybe we'd all better sit down. Uh, thank you. Has Trippy done something awful? Uh, your brother has good many qualities, Miss Trellis. Oh, this is going to be worse than I thought. As a bond salesman, he made a brilliant start. His orders piled up until we discover that these people he's been selling stock to don't even exist. You see, he, he threw in enough consolations to make the whole thing seem quite authentic. And then, well, there... There were here and there, there were uh, some legitimate sales. But you had to look for them. It wasn't very clever of him, was it? He has a definite talent for picking odd names and addresses. But it's hardly worth $20,000 we've paid him in commission. He's stolen $20,000? Yes, I'm afraid so. Does Trippy know you know? Yes. You should have gone to the district attorney long ago. Well, I was quite touched to discover he lost most of the money at the racetrack. That touched you? Yes, sir. Uh, Considering they were my horses he bet on, and I'd give him the tip. Oh, Trippy. Trippy, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Trevis. Fortunately, it won't be any hardship for you to return the money. No hardship. Uh, Mr. Skeffington, you may as well know that Miss Trellis and her brother are stone broke. I don't understand. The Trellis' wealth was a leap. Well, now it's a myth. It's been a myth for some time. Mrs. Skeffington, Trippy could get another job and pay you back a little each week. You couldn't write him a reference, could you? Well, I could. But my heart wouldn't be in it. Well, all we can do then is to throw ourselves on your mercy. Uh, Miss Trellis, it's not my money. It's the corporation. But the horses were yours and not the corporation's, weren't they? Yes, that's true. Uh, but I'm not quite sure of the logic. If you could just give us a little time, maybe there's something I could salvage. Well, perhaps I can let it ride for a little while. Oh, Mr. Skeffington, how can I thank you? How can please, I... Please, please. Well, I see my... I'm keeping you from your guests. Oh, won't you stay for dinner? After all, in a way, you're the host. It's your money. I'm dining with the district attorney. 
just a social call. Uh, good night, Miss Trelly. Good night, Mr. Skeffin. Mr. Trelly, good night, sir. Oh, I'd like to wring Trippy's neck. There's nothing to worry about, Georgie. No? No. There'll be three dozen roses in the morning. Three dozen roses? From Mr. Skeffin, sir. <laughs> Good morning, Miss. Good morning, Mandy. Just look, Miss. All these flowers. What a beautiful basket. Oh, Mandy, which ones are for Mr. Skeffington? No flowers came for Mr. Skeffington, Miss. These are Mr. Thatcher's and Mr. Condoleez. Were there any calls, Mandy? I mean, other than Mr. Thatcher's and Mr. Condoleez? The Reverend Dr. Parker. He wanted to know if you sold the bazaar ticket. No, not a one. You're sure there were no other calls? No, Miss. Uh, Mandy, would you mind looking up the address of Skeff? Uh, no, no, never mind. Uh, Mamby, I'm going downtown. If my brother or cousin should ask, I've gone shopping. Miss Trelly, I... Oh, well, uh, please come in. I had no idea you'd be calling. I... I knew you were busy, Mr. Skeffington. I didn't mind waiting, and... Oh, I do want you to know I'm not here to talk about Trippy. Good. It's a painful subject. Cigar? <laughs> Oh, I'm terribly sorry. It's automatic. All my visitors are men. I see. Mr. Skeffington, I came to ask if you'd buy some tickets for a bazaar. It's for the children's hospital or the, the home for the aged. I don't quite remember which. Anyway, it's printed on the ticket. They're $25 a piece. Well, I... well, they're both very worthy causes. I'll take a dozen. Oh, no, two is quite enough. You don't get a thing for your money. Or uh, are you used to that? Excuse me. Hello? Yes. Yes. What is it now? All right. Buy 10,000 at 23 in the house. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Skeffington, please forgive me for being so curious, but it sounds very important. 10,000 what? 10,000 shares of steel. Oh, at 23 and a half dollars a share? Why, yes. Well, if you're that casual about money, I'll let you buy the dozen tickets after all. You know, Mr. Skeffington, I've never once seen the stock exchange. I'd be glad to show you around sometime. Well, that's very nice of you, but isn't it a little vague? Can you make it right now? Well, I have a luncheon engagement with Janie Clarkson, but we don't like each other very much, so she probably won't be there either. Well, in that case, will you have lunch with me? Oh, I'd be delighted. Then could I see the stock exchange afterwards? If you'd like. Uh, shall we go then to the... Have yes. you seen the ticker? No, why? <laughs> Germany just declared war on Washington. Oh, excuse me, Miss Freddy. Get all our branch offices on the phone. Yes, sir. Keep a wire open to Washington. Hello, Casey. Keep me posted on wheat. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, I know. Wheat is up 28, shall we buy? No, sell. Sell all the own. Yes, sir. Wheat's up 12. What, what about you? Chicago? Mr. What about Chicago? Chicago? We're in stock. Shall we call for margin? There's Casey. Somebody get hold of Casey. Mr. Skeffing and I've changed my mind. I'm having lunch with Jamie Clarkson after all. Watson wants an immediate answer. Well, they won't get it. Miss Freddy. Where did you go? Miss Freddy! Fanny's retreat from Skeffington's office was one of her very rare defeats. And it took the outbreak of the First World War to do it. Well, two days later, a strange thing happened. Paul Vanny, the famous painter, called. He said he had a commission to paint Fanny's portrait if she'd agree. She refused to divulge his patron's name. Fanny thought it quite a lot. Weeks later, when the portrait was completed, we went to Vanny's studio to look at it. You know what happened yesterday, Georgie? Jim Connolly offered Mr. Vanny double his fee for the portrait. That is quite true, Mr. Trello. Well, why didn't you accept? Because my client is paying four times as much. The extra money to keep me quiet. <laughs> Fanny, I simply don't understand. It's not like you to have to spend all these tiresome hours sitting for a portrait you won't own for a man you don't even know. I think it's very romantic. Romantic? <laughs> what if we walk into a saloon someday and see you hanging over a bar? Georgie, I doubt very much if I'll ever get that drunk. Anyway... Whoever ordered the portrait is sending $1,000 to my favorite charity. Georgie, would it be charity if we used that money for Trippy? $1,000 won't help, Fanny. So we may as well be honest. Uh, by the way, you've heard nothing from Skeffington? Not a word. Hmm. Well, I must say he's been very decent. Sooner or later, though, we'll have to face him. Well, Mr. Vanny, what happens to the portrait now? The transfer men are waiting with the truck. It'll be delivered. Oh, it will. Well, um, 
Well, I, I think I'll be running along, Georgie. I have a, a date with Jamie Clarkson. You do? Didn't I tell you? Thank you very much, Mr. Vanier. You may tell your client I hope he's pleased. On the street, I saw Fanny getting into a taxi cab. A taxi cab parked directly behind a transfer truck. I should have known from the start. She'd find out who commissioned that portrait if it took her the rest of her life. Actually, it took about 30 minutes. The painting was delivered to the home of Job Skeffington. Two days later, Fanny and Job Skeffington went off to New Jersey and were married. Coming back to New York, they took the ferry boat across the North River. Joe? Yes, Fanny? Where were you born? Right there, in New York, Cherry Street. Cherry Street? Where's that? In the slums. Skeffington. That's a strange name for the slums. It's not my real name, you know. The immigration official wasn't a good speller. Skeffington was the closest he could get some uh, to Skevinskazaya. Joe? Do you realize I know next to nothing about you? Were you poor? We have no idea how poor. Well, then, how did you become so successful? It's routine. Rags to riches. Of course, I sold newspapers. Of course, there was a messenger on Wall Street and went to school at night. Well, you can fill in the rest. There's one difference. You didn't marry the boss's daughter. No. But I married the woman everybody else wanted. That makes up for it. <laughs> Joe, what's going on over there? The music and all those people? Mm -hmm. Find out. Attendant. Yes, sir. Uh, what's going on over there? Oh, that's uh, Philippe and Gus. They're playing for those kids. See? Those kids just got married. Sometimes they find somebody that just got married. That's what they look for. Good tips. But how can they tell? Oh, I don't know what they do. They ain't missed up on newlyweds for ten years. Can you beat that? Joe, could you tell they were just married? Mm, I think I could. The way that girl's looking at that fellow, you couldn't miss. I see what you mean. The way I'm looking at you. No. You look as cordial, but not connubial. I've married you, Fanny, but I haven't won you. Joe. So far, I've merely taken you away from all the others. Do you think that night when I broke into your dinner party was the first time I'd seen you? No. I'd seen you many times. Dining at Sherry's, dancing at the Waldorf, and so many young men. But you were never more beautiful than at night I came to see about Trippy. Never so unattainable. That's why I commissioned Vanny to paint your portrait. At least I'd have that. Well, now you have both, the portrait and me. I own both. It isn't quite the same thing. Joe, look, the musicians are coming this way. They went right on past me. You see? Just the point I was trying to make before. Fanny, why did you marry me? Because you're good and kind. And your eyes are special in a St. Bernard sort of way. And although I, I've never seen you really smile, I, I always have the feeling you're laughing at me. And I find that very attractive. Besides, you're very rich. Joe, would you like to kiss me? Our stars, Betty Davis and Paul Henry, will return for Act Two of Mr. Skeffington in a moment. Contrary to what most people think, everyone in Hollywood isn't a movie star or extra. Hundreds of girls work in the studios as secretaries, typists, telephone operators, and live just like girls anywhere else in the country. Take Alice Deeg, who typed the script for Warner Brothers' new production, Mildred Pierce, starring Joan Crawford. Alice is just coming home from work. You. In the kitchen. What's up? Oh, Sue, it's wonderful. Bill Chip just came in. Oh, Alice. We're going to dinner at the Brown Derby and then to a preview of Mildred Pierce. That's Joan Crawford's new one. Oh, it's her first picture in almost three years, isn't mm -hmm. it? Jack Carson and Zachary Scott are in it with her. And imagine, I'll see it with Bill. It just opened in New York and the critics raved about it. 
I understand it's considered an excellent candidate for an Academy Award. Yes, a date like that calls for wearing something special. Mm, I thought I'd wear my new suit and that sweet blouse I got for my birthday. Of course, I'll have to have a super slip because it's so sheer. Oh, Sue. Not what? I haven't any. I meant to buy a new slip today. Well, what about the one you bought a couple of months ago with the lace on the bottom? You know, I bought one just like Oh, it. you should see it. It's faded and the lace is torn and straps are frayed. I don't know what Sarah does to them. Well, Sarah puts everything in the same wash. See? Towels along with your undies. I've seen her. They can't take that hot water and strong soap and rough treatment. You mean your slip is still good? Of course. I always lux mine. Look, I'll show you. Why, oh, Sue, it looks as nice as new. Oh, Sue. I know. I let myself in for it. You want to borrow it. Sue, if you lend it to me this once. Yes, lux slips do stay lovely longer. In fact, three times as long, actual washing tests show. Strong soap, too hot water, and rough treatment soon fade colors. Make slips and nighties look old and drab. Start tonight using thrifty Lux Care for undies. Here's William Keeley with our stars. Our curtain rises on the second act of tonight's play, starring Betty Davis as Fanny and Paul Henry as Mr. Skeffington. Yes, that was a long time ago, their marriage, 1914. And I wonder when I saw him a few hours ago, alone in the empty park, I wonder if Job, too, was thinking of what I am thinking now, of how, after his marriage to Fanny, he had taken her across that park to her home. She wanted to see Trippy, her brother. Said she saw me. Dear. Congratulations, Fanny and Joe. Well, congratulations. Thank you, George. I, for one, am delighted. Why do you say I, for one? Because all your bows are here. Thatcher, Morrison, Condoley, even that idiot Chester. They're quite crushed. They're in the kitchen eating turkey sandwiches. And Trippy? Oh, Trippy's out. Uh, Fanny, I don't mind feeding your suitors, but you're going to have to console. Well, Joe, should we get it over with? Well, I don't know if I'm quite up to it. They are full of turkey, and I'm not. But come on, I'm game. Well, gentlemen, good evening. I rather expected you'd all be here to welcome me. I don't believe you've ever met Mrs. Skeffington, have you? Joe, Mr. Condoley, Mr. Pastor, Mr. Morrison, and Mr. Mr. Hayes. You didn't get married. Chester, darling, this cranberry on your chin. Could I get you all some dessert? I'm afraid the best I can offer is canned peaches. Georgie, would you bring... Mr. and Mrs. Skeffington. Trippy, darling. Then you've heard. Everybody's heard. It's in the papers. We're on the front page? Not quite. You're listed under business transactions. Trippy. Trippy, you'd better go upstairs. Shame on you, boys, letting yourselves be outbid. That's about enough, Trippy. Fanny, would you mind going inside? Oh, so I'm going to be challenged. He's going to heave his checkbook in my face. Trippy, you don't know what you're saying. You're drunk. I'm the one who swindled you, Skeffington. Why did you have to put her in jail? Why, you <laughs> little swine, get out of here. Yes, I'll get out. You make me sick to my stomach, all of you. Would you? Would you? Please. No, Trippy. No. Trippy, how could you? How could you? How could you? I didn't even know you were seeing him. But you're so wrong. Job has character, and he's very nice. Oh, don't try to tell me you're in love with him. I'm not drunk enough to bear that. I'll tell you this much. You're safe now. You don't have to worry about anything anymore. That's why you married him. Because I owed him $20,000. Trippy, I'm very fond of Job. But I love you. Now, Trippy, darling, go downstairs and apologize. Apologize? I'll spit in his eye. Trippy, when you get to know Joe better... I'm taking very good care that I don't get to know him better. I'm going to Europe. Europe? Well, isn't there a war on That's there? just why I'm going. I don't know who's going to get me. The French, the British. I'll toss a coin. Oh, Trippy, you're out of your mind. Yes, and you're humiliated and sick. I hate him. I hate myself. Trippy, if you love me at all, you won't leave. I love you very much. But I despise Mrs. Yes. Besides that. Trippy. Trippy. That was the last we saw of Trippy. 
I was with Job and Fanny on their first wedding anniversary. Before dinner, Job and I were alone in the study. Well, just we three for dinner, Job? Uh, no, uh, Ed Morrison, probably. Morris? He barged in. He's upstairs with her now. Well, doesn't he know it's your anniversary? He said he chose this night especially to ask her for my wife's hand in marriage. Well, your marrying Fanny hasn't discouraged any of them, has it? On the contrary. They seem to feel they have to rescue her. The trouble with Fanny is he's too kind to them. So gentle and considerate. How has she been with you, Job? Kind, gentle, and considerate. I'm a very patient man, Joe. All right, Fanny. I'll leave. But remember, I haven't given up yet. Well, apparently Morrison is not staying. He'll be back again in about two weeks. Hello, George. Oh, hello, Fanny. Good evening, Joe, dear. George, your flowers are beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. Do you like my gown, Joe? You look beautiful, Fanny. Beautiful. <laughs> Fanny, I, I thought you might like this. It's a, uh, well, uh, here. Uh, you open it. A diamond bracelet. Job Skeffing. Oh, it's lovely. You know, George, I keep forgetting that Job can afford to give me things like this. <laughs> How very sweet of you, Job. You know, I'm simply famished. Is dinner ready? All ready. Uh, one thing about these proposals from Fanny's suitors, George. Yes? They certainly give her a whale of an appetite. We went to the theater after dinner. Fanny was her usual sparkling self until we returned. And then suddenly she was ill. Before we knew it, she'd fallen to the floor. Now don't worry, Mrs. Skeffington. She's perfectly all right. Then why did she faint, Doctor? I usually make a ceremony out of these things, but, well, you're going to be a father. Why? Why, thank you. That's perfectly all right. <laughs> May I, uh... May I go in and see her? I've given her a sedative, but uh, you'll have about five minutes for the usual nonsense. Good night. Good night, Doctor. Fanny. Is there anything I can do? No. Would you like to be alone? No. Well, I, I think any child of ours has a far chance of being stupid. You're laughing at me again, Joe. Oh, I suppose I'm just as fond of children as anybody else. It's, well, it's just that the babies grow up and everybody expects you to grow up with them. You are not afraid of growing old, are you, Fanny? Yes, I am. Do I look puffy yet? Oh. No, you look beautiful. I don't know why. My face is all tear-stained. I wanted to keep on crying, but I didn't have the strength. Soon I'll be all puffy and ugly. I don't want anybody to see me like that. I couldn't bear it. Fanny. Joe, George is going to California soon. I want to go with him and have my baby there. But I thought you loved this house. Oh, of course I do, but it's, it's too close to all my friends. I won't have them see me ugly. You'll never be ugly, Fanny. A woman is beautiful when she's loved. And only then. Nonsense. A woman is beautiful if she has eight hours sleep and goes to the beauty parlor every day. <laughs> and bone structure has a lot to do with it, too. Fanny, aren't you really happy about having a baby? Joe, I just can't seem to keep my eyes open any longer. Yes, dear. I'll, I'll go now. Fanny's baby was born in California. A month later, she was back in New York, a devoted gentleman flocking about her as fervently as ever. But Job was too enchanted with his little daughter to bother about them. A week before the child's second birthday, word came that Trippy had been killed in action. Fanny went completely to pieces in a frightening burst of hysteria. Please, oh, get I, hold of yourself. I told him not to go to war. I told him, I told him, I told Fanny, him. Fanny, Fanny, let me oh, say something, no, please. No, leave me alone. Trippy's dead. Trippy's George, dead. see what you can do. I'll get some brandy. Maybe that's <laughs> Fanny, Fanny, darling, oh, now George. you must. 
George, if it hadn't been for Joe, Trippy would never have gone to war at all. He killed Trippy. He killed my brother. Honey, you know that isn't yes, true. Yes, he did. And I'll go on living with him for the rest of my life. Fanny, please. And for the rest of my life, he'll keep on looking at me with those puppy dog eyes of his. So good and so kind and so sickening. Joe loves you very much. You know it's that. It's really funny. I married Job so I could take care of Trippy. And now Trippy's dead. And all I've got is Job. All I've got is... I... I've brought you some brandy. Drink it down if you can. It will do you good. <laughs> I suppose whatever Fanny did from then on, she could justify because Trippy was dead. Very little changed over the years, least of all Fanny's youth and radiance. She simply refused to grow any older. During the speakeasy era, she became fashionably involved with a rum runner. And Job, quite openly, started to be seen with girls from his office. Just what was in his mind, I'll never know. Only one thing is certain. If he was trying to give Fanny grounds for divorce, he was highly successful. Oh, hello, Georgie. All by yourself? Uh-huh. Job's in the garden. With Fanny? Yes. How was it in court? Dull as dishwater. Fanny, tell me. Does she know about the divorce, young Fanny? It's quite impossible to keep anything from her. Mm -hmm. She's 11 years old now. You don't have to remind me. Oh, Fanny. Can't you find it possible to forgive Job? Five secretaries in a row. I'm not that forgiving. Well, the second secretary must have forgiven him for the first, all the way down the line. Can't you be as forgiving as a secretary? Well, as a matter of fact, Georgie, I'm very grateful to Joe. I must admit I was quite angry at first. Then suddenly I realized that the five secretaries were five gates of freedom. Now you can live with your conscience. Yes. I hope the two of you are very happy. George. Is custody of the child always given to the mother? Why, don't you want her? Oh, of course, of course. It's just that, well, poor little thing. I can't help but feel she'd so much rather be with Joe. Well, oh, hello, Fanny. Well, how did it go? Very tiresome, Joe. By naps now and then, so did the judge. Georgie, why don't you run out in the garden and amuse Fanny? Of course. I'm in a highly amusing mood. Well, Joe, are you comfortable at the club? I have a choice view of 47th Street. Oh, I do want to thank you for your very generous settlement. Well, 12 years with the wrong husband should be rewarded. Well, of course, it was ridiculous of you to settle a fortune on me, but then it would have been ridiculous for me to refuse with this. I'm glad you're going to be so reasonable about it. Still laughing at me, without moving a muscle. I assure you, Fanny, it's no laughing matter. Oh, I can't bear to look at you, Job. Your eyes have such a hurt expression. Then I repudiate my eyes. I have no right to feel hurt. I'm sorry, Job. I'm really sorry I can't love you. You can't really love anyone. Well... Well, that's not meant as a reproach. It's just one of the facts of your life. You know, Job, I'm very fond of you, and I might never have taken this step at all if I hadn't discovered... Well, after all, Job, five of them. Oh, you mustn't think so harshly of my secretary. They were very nice and understanding. When I came home to the when I came to the office after a hard day at home. Joe Brill. Oh, Fanny, I Joe, don't... please don't beg. Beg you, Fanny? I never begged you in my life. Oh, I have a dreadful headache. This isn't what I wanted to discuss with you at all. I'm sorry, but I have a headache too. And I think mine precedes yours by quite a few years. I find this all very distasteful. All right. What is it you want to discuss? Our daughter. She's not going to be very happy staying with me. She loves you so much more. I'm no hypocrite. I'm glad she does. Yes, but you see, the court says a child should stay with its mother. Never mind what the court says. What do you say? Well, I think that a child should, but it's just... Are you I... sure that she won't be uh, a hindrance to you? After all, you're young and beautiful. Don't be insulting. It isn't fair, Job. You know perfectly well that if Fanny is miserable, I shall be miserable too. Well, what do you want me to do? Well, if you could... Could talk to her, Job, and, and see how she feels about it. All right. It. I'll be glad to. Oh, thank you, Job. That's very sweet of you. May I take her out to dinner? That would be lovely. Maybe she could wear her blue organdy. She reminds me of you, you know. Don't 
darling. You haven't eaten hardly anything. Uh, I'm not very hungry. You haven't eaten either, Daddy. Oh, I had a big lunch. It's a very nice orchestra, isn't it? Very nice. Yes, darling. It is. Daddy, aren't you coming home to live anymore? I'm afraid not, Fanny. Besides, I'm... I'm going to Europe in a few weeks. Uh, I'll be gone a long time. Oh, Daddy. Hush now. The wait is coming. Oh, I'm sorry, Dad. Everything all right, sir? Yes, thank you. But, well, we are not hungry. Oh, will the young lady have some dessert? No, thank you. Oh, we have some very delicious cream glacé. That means ice cream, Daddy. Mm -hmm. Vanilla, peppermint, strawberry? No, thank you. Uh, you can bring the young lady a tall glass of milk. Yes, sir. Fanny, dear, you'll see. You'll be very happy with your mother. Your mother loves you. Yes, Daddy, but, but you love me, too, don't you? Yes. Why wouldn't I be happy with you, too? Well, I don't know if I can explain this to you, Fanny. You see, your mother and I are of different faith. You believe in God, don't you? Certainly I do. Well, so does Mommy. She told me so. Well, Fanny, it's, uh... You see, I'm Jewish. Your mother isn't. Now, if you stay with her, you will never know what it is to be a... Well, I, I, I mean, if, if you come to Europe with me, it's different there, and people may look upon you as... Uh, uh, it's very difficult to explain to a child... If you don't want me, Daddy, I suppose I can always live by myself. Thanks. Oh, Daddy, Daddy, please take me with you, even to Europe. I won't be any trouble, I promise. You do, do you? Well, well, let me see. You know, darling, there are wonderful schools in Switzerland. And you'll speak to Mother? Oh, maybe she'll say yes. Oh, she will, darling, she will. Oh, Daddy. Hush, now, hush. Here comes your milk. I think I'll have some ice cream after all. Yes, and uh, waiter, you can bring me a plate too. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Oh, who wants to know? Why Alexis Smith always wears a gold anklet? Because her ankles are so slim? Well, they are, but the reason is much more sentimental. The anklet's engraved with the date she and her husband met, and she hasn't had it off since they were married. Alexis' legs are lovely, but you can judge for yourself when you see her in Rhapsody in Blue, the big new musical based on the life of George Gershwin. Girls off the screen as well as on the screen like to flatter their legs. Here's one important secret. Lux flakes for stockings save their elasticity. They can give as you move, but spring back into shape, always keeping their flattering fit. Of course, Lux stockings last longer, too. In strain tests, Lux stockings lasted twice as long as those washed with strong soap or rubbed with cake soap. So, for better fit and better wear, give your stockings Lux care. If your dealer is out of Lux flakes right now, try again soon. More is on the way. Lux is worth waiting for. Back to William Keeley and our stars. After the final curtain, we hope you'll join us for a brief chat with tonight's stars. And now, here's Act Three of Mr. Skeffington, with Betty Davis as Fanny and Paul Henry as Job. So, Job Skeffington went to Europe to Germany, and his daughter went with him, and there Job stayed. But as little Fanny grew up, she'd come to New York every summer. <laughs> Too bad she picked that time of year. Her mother never seemed to be in town. My darling daughter, where does time go? I thought surely I could see you this summer. I plan to be in New York in August. But that dreadful yacht at the Barnby broke down off the banner. Dearest Fanny, to think so many years have passed and we still haven't seen each other, 
but Mother misses you very, very much. I am glad you liked your birthday gift. I don't remember when you... And so it went for ten years. But this year, young Fanny failed to arrive in the summer. She came instead on an embarrassing October afternoon. Her mother was home having a cocktail with a young man. The older Fanny grew, the younger, it seemed, were her admirers. Fanny, remember that day at the country club when I introduced myself? Yes, Johnny. Well, I'm finally going to say what I wanted to say to you then. I'm in love with you, Fanny. You're really very sweet, Johnny. Oh, that tolerant tone. Johnny, if we're going sailing, we'd better get started. Do we have to go sailing? Oh, but I love sailing. And what is it, Clinton? Excuse me, madam. A young lady to see you. A young lady? She says she's your... Hello, mother. Good heavens. Fanny. Fanny Duckling. My darling, this is such a surprise. Yes, I, I suppose it is, mother. You know you're the... Uh, the last person I expected to see. Is um, your father with you? Oh, no, he, he's still in Berlin. He says the Nazis don't frighten him, but he thought I'd better come back here to you. And here you are. Here I am. Uh, <coughs> oh, Johnny. Oh, forgive me, Fanny, this is Johnny Mitchell. Johnny, this is my uh, baby, Fanny. How do you do? Hello. Fanny and I, uh, Fanny and I haven't seen each other for years, have we, darling? You know, you're very uh, tall for your age. Really? Oh, but Mother, I'm nearly... Uh, oh, she's my... going to be a stunning woman, don't you think, darling? Oh, yes. Yes, she's going to be. Uh, darling, Johnny and I are going to go sailing. When I get back, we can talk for days and days. Well, Fanny, do you think we ought to? It gets pretty chilly. Chilly? You talk as if you were 40, 50 years old or something. Certainly we're going sailing. Well, I'll, I'll see you later then. Oh, yes. Hey, wait. I, I can't call you both, Fanny. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll call you young Fanny, and you... <laughs> well, uh, I'll think of something. <laughs> Hello? Fanny? Yes? This is Johnny Mitchell. Yes? Look, I, I don't want to alarm you, but... Well, your mother, we were coming in when she, well, she, she just collapsed. She got pretty wet sailing. She, she must have gotten a chill or something. Well, where is she now? I'm bringing her right home. You, you'd better call a doctor. Is your mother's maid around? Mamby, yes. Well, Mamby will know who to call. I'll, I'll have her home in half an hour. <laughs> that night, Fanny was in the hospital with a raging fever, diphtheria. Doctors warned her she might not live. At her age, they said. At her age? Who'd ever thought of Fanny as old? The beautiful, dazzling Mrs. Kessington. Well, Fanny didn't die. And in ten days after she'd passed the crisis. Yes, Mrs. Kessington? No. Did Dr. Nelson say when I may have visited? Yes, Thursday morning. But only one or two, please. Ask him to please telephone my home. Under no circumstances do I want any visitors. No one must see me. No one. Oh, hello, Cousin George. Oh, hello, dear. Well, did your mother get home? Mm, ten minutes ago. We were just having some tea. I would have to be out of town when all this happened. Well, did you two finally get acquainted? Oh, I'm afraid we've hardly had the chance. The doctor wouldn't allow any visitors at the hospital, and when she went to the rest home, she told me not to come. Oh, darling, you don't know your mother very well. She wouldn't want anyone to see her unless she was looking her absolute best. And they tell me diphtheria is no beauty. Well, you have company already, Mother. Georgie, what an unexpected pleasure. How are you, Fanny? Very well, thank you, even if I do look so dreadful. You could never look anything but adorable. You're lying, Georgie. I know perfectly well how I look. Have some tea, George. Wasn't it just like me to contract the child's disease? But it's the most dreadful nuisance. Handfuls of my hair came out. Only simply saved my life. Who's only? My hairdresser, of course. I don't know what I would have done without him. But here I am, chattering on about myself. 
Annette, what have you been doing? Oh, nothing very much, Mother. Have you seen Johnny Mitchell? Yes, I've seen him. He's fine. Georgie, do you know who I've been seeing? Oh, who? Joe. Joe? Yes, he just sits around all day, staring at me with those soulful eyes of his. Oh, you mean you've been having hallucinations? Is that what it is? One day in the hospital, I shut my eyes, and he suddenly appeared. Now I don't even have to shut my eyes. He appears just the same. Fanny, I do wish you'd write your father and ask him to stop it. Have you heard from him lately? No, not for weeks and weeks, and I'm, I'm terribly worried. Well, he hasn't had time to write. He's been too busy staring at me. I detest women who go to psychoanalysts, Georgie, but what else am I to do? I'm seeing one next week, Dr. Tyler. Wonderful. Well, now I think I'll go to my room and rest. Georgie, would you help a decrepit old lady up the stairs? Oh, Fanny, what nonsense. Keep talking, Mrs. Skeffington. I've told you about the hallucinations, Dr. Tyler. What else is there to talk about? How old are you? Forty-five. Sixty. Well, I didn't sleep very well last night. Sleep is most important to a woman of your age. If you don't want to be an eyesore... Eyesore? Are you suggesting I am an eyesore? No, nor are you a Lillian Russell. Dr. Tyler! Step down. My dear lady, your seeing your husband comes out of a subconscious desire to see him, a need for him. That's ridiculous. Nevertheless, that's where your husband comes in when your romantic days are over. My romantic days are over? Oh, my poor woman. Oh, my poor doctor. Listen to me. The only person who will stick to such a woman as you is your husband. Admirers, sweethearts, whatever you choose to call them, never mean what they say and always end up by turning sour on the stomach. Your result. But my advice is sound. If you don't believe me, find out for yourself. See them, these gentlemen of your past. Ask the whole lot of them in for dinner. You can size them up, and they can size you up. Shall I make you a waiter? If I wanted to, not that I do, but if I wanted to, all I would have to do is smile at one of them. All right, why don't you try it? Oh, you want me to prove it to you? No, to yourself. I'm sorry to have to be so blunt, Mrs. Skeffington, but you're one of the vast army of silly women. Capital S, capital W. You're overdressed, over made up, and you're most certainly over perfumed. You are the rudest man I ever met. Did you come here to consult a gentleman or a doctor? I strongly suspect you are neither, and I'm not at all impressed with your manner. You will be when you get my bill. Go back to your husband. And you know where you can go. <laughs> Fanny must have known what the party would be like. But along with her false hair, she wore a false gaiety just as difficult to detect. They trooped in the stout-hearted gentlemen of her past, who now were merely stout. They brought their wives along, and it was all very dismal and somewhat heartbreaking. Fortunately, they left early, all but Edward Morrison. He took Fanny out on the terrace. Fanny, oh, my darling. The same Edward romantic as ever. And just look at us. You're bald and I'm dilapidated. Well, that's ridiculous. We're both in the prime of life. And I still want to marry you, Fanny. Edward, you can't be serious. Fanny, I love you. I love you, Fanny. Edward, please. Oh, Fanny, we'll have a glorious life together. We'll... No. Yes, Edward? I... I'm afraid I've disturbed your hair, dear. These, uh, These curls... What's the mystery? They're always falling off. Uh, they're, uh, very pretty. May I pin them on for you? No, Edward. Thank you. I think I'd better do it myself. They're very expensive, you know. Oh. <laughs> well, thank heaven you don't have to worry about things like that. Oh, huh? but I do. Only it keeps me practically broke. They're broke? Well, practically. You, uh, you can't mean that, Fanny. If only I'd had a man to advise me, you should have returned a few years earlier, Edward. Yes, yes, I, I should have. It's getting late. Yes, uh, uh, don't bother seeing me to the door, Fanny. I'll think over your proposal. Oh, oh, oh well, don't be too hasty. <laughs> Marriage is, is a very serious step, hmm? Yes, it is, Edward. I'm so glad to have seen you. Goodbye, Fanny. Oh, uh... 
You don't happen to know of anyone interested in buying a coffee plantation, do you? No, but if I hear of anyone, I shall be very happy to let you know. Thank you, Fanny. It's no good, but it's all I've got left. Mother. Mother, may I speak to you? Of course, Fanny. Mother, I just left John. John and his two? Yes. We're going to be married. But I had no idea, Fanny. You haven't known him for very long. I've known him for several months. As long as I've known you. Don't you think you should have talked it over with your mother? Have I a mother? That's not very kind, Fanny. I've always loved you very much. Sort of a, a long-distance love. I never wanted you to leave me. It was just that you loved your father so much more. Oh, I know you had a difficult choice to make. You, you couldn't be both a beauty and a mother. Oh, Mother, I, I used to worry about my looks, too, when I was 13 and all arms and legs. But Father would always comfort me. A woman is beautiful only when she's loved, he'd say. Yes. He said that to me once, too. Fanny, do you suppose it's too late for me to be a mother to you now? I'd like to try. Oh, it wouldn't work out, Mother. I see. We're leaving for Seattle tonight. Johnny's opening a branch office there. Well, I... I suppose you wish me luck. Of course, Fanny. Thank you. Goodbye, Mother. Goodbye, Doc. <laughs> Man. 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 Mandy, don't leave me. Oh, why, of course I won't. You're the only one I have left. I'll never leave you, never. Mandy, I'm alone. I'm all alone. A few moments ago, Mandy telephoned me. She wanted to know if I'd come over and see Fanny tomorrow. She thought I might cheer her up. And just now the phone rang again. It was Job Skeffington. He said he wanted to say goodbye. He was going to leave New York. But I made him promise to see me first. In the morning. Georgie, what are you doing here at 10 o'clock in the morning? Oh, I thought I'd just drop by and see how you were. Well, it was uh, nice seeing all your old friends at the party the other night, wasn't it? It was Pure vanity, George. Uh, what makes you so nervous? Fanny. Fanny, I'm worried. I, I've just seen Job. Job? But you couldn't have. Job is in Germany. No, no, he's right here in New York. If he's here, why didn't he let his own daughter know? When you see him, you'll understand. He's been in a concentration camp. You'll hardly recognize him. They took everything he had, Fanny. Job hasn't got a thing. Job, poor. What do you think I ought to do? It isn't a question of what you ought to do. Of course, you have no obligation. I think you should remember that this house, everything in it, every stitch you own is yours because of his generosity. And it's unfair that I'm so well off and he's so poor. Yes, exactly. Very well. I'll send for the lawyers and see what we can do for them. No, 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 Fanny. No lawyers. You mean I must see Job myself? Yes. He's downstairs. Downstairs? In this house now? Go down and see him, Fanny. Never. Look at me, Georgie. Just look at what's left of But you me. always seem the same to Job. He still loves you. No, Georgie. He loved only what I looked like. Oh, that isn't true, and you know it. Georgie, do you think I am mentally deficient? I've seen the others. They all love me, too. At the party the other night, one look at me, and they all recoiled. And I'm not going to add Job to the list. Despise me, George. You didn't know what a really vain creature you'd been fond of all these years. You've never loved anyone but yourself, have you, Fanny? Spent your life in front of a mirror, completely unaware of the people around you. Now, look, here's a chance for you to do something for someone else. 
A lot worse things in this world than losing one's beauty. Oh, go down, Fanny. You won't regret it. Go down and face him. Very well, George. I'll... I'll go down. Joe. Is it Fanny? You don't know me, do you, Joe? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. You're as, as beautiful as ever. Still laughing at me, Joe. Oh, no, Fanny, no. You see, I am... Joe! Joe! Joe, are you hurt? I thought I remembered where... Oh, Joe. Die. Oh, no, Joe, my darling. You can't see. They didn't. The Nazis. No, oh, no. my poor darling. My poor dear Joe. And all the time I've been thinking only of myself. Joe. Joe, you're safe now. Fanny. You're home with me. You're safe now. Fanny. Come, Joe. Here. Here's my arm. Here's your cane, Joe. Thank you, Fanny. Come along. Nancy! Nancy, Mr. Skeffington has come home. Oh, welcome home, Mr. Skeffington. Thank you, Mandy. Joe, here's George. Fanny, I've never seen you look more beautiful. A woman is beautiful only when she is loved. Isn't that right, Joe? Fanny. Nancy, would you call Janie Clarkson? Tell her I can't possibly see her for lunch today. Before we bring our stars back to a present call, we would like to make this important announcement. Starting today, your meat dealer will give you not two, but four points and four cents for every pound of used fats you turn in. Fats and oils in most meats, except low grades, continue to be rationed. Used fats are urgently needed to speed up reconversion to peacetime goods. I didn't know used fats were needed now that the shooting's over. But they are more than ever. It takes grease and oil to help manufacture that new refrigerator you want, or a car, or a sewing machine, or a washer, or any of thousands of products you've been waiting for. And if there aren't enough fats and oils and greases to go around, some industry has to do with less. Soap, for instance. But soap doesn't use heavy greases like industry, does it? No, but industry gets first claim so it can put men back to work. The more used fats you turn in, the more of the finer oils needed for soap making can be released. Well, if the government thinks it's important enough to give me double the points for saving fats, I guess I'll start another can tonight with the drippings from the frying pan. And save used fat from every meal. Roaster and broiler drippings, meat trimmings and table scrapings, too. Remember, from now on, you get double the points. Four for every pound of used fat you turn in. Think of the extra butter or bacon or meat you can buy with them. Here's William Keeley at our microphone. I can assure you it's been a real pleasure to work with two such stars as Betty Davis and Paul Henry. And the result has been a play we'll long remember. It's good to be back on Lux and back with you again, Bill. Again? Have you two worked together before? Oh, yes, Paul. I was dialogue director on the first picture in which Betty changed from innocent ingenue roles to, uh... Go ahead and say it. Well, Betty, you know you have brought more misery to humanity than any other star in Hollywood. <laughs> but only on the screen. Thank you. You know, Betty, when I was in Paris a few months ago, I, I stopped at the Paris canteen. They were hoping for a visit from you. I had planned to go over, Bill, but the last minute couldn't and was very disappointed. They couldn't spare Betty from the Hollywood canteen. Oh. Yeah. Well, Betty, you and your associates have done a really magnificent job at the canteen. Well, my associates and I... Thank you, Bill. Matter of fact, after the canteen closes on Thanksgiving Day, I'll have to find something else to do. Yes, and I, I hope that something else will include another picture for Warner's. As fine as your latest one, the corner's green. Well, as long as we're patting people on the back, Bill, save a pat for Paul. Well, I was just coming to that. I was lucky enough to see a preview of Paul's next picture. 